coming along to this session on uh, distribution in the digital age. Uh, my name is Paul Davis. I'm the moderator. Um, I, I first of all, I have to say thank you very much to the sponsor of this session, which is Film Auckland. Um, they're responsible for putting up the wherewithal to enable this to happen. Um, we've got uh, a very broad topic to cover. Um, and it's, um, it's going to cover everything, well, it's going to range over a wide area from the, the uh, very important shift from 35 millimeter to digital projection that's happening in cinemas around the world at the moment. And then moving through to covering the actual digital distribution on new platforms such as over the internet or through social media outlets, uh, cell phones, um, and, and the like. And wrapped around that, of course, is using the new digital media to market films. So we're going to be looking at the kind of physical uh, distribution and projection of films as, all, as well as digital marketing. Okay. The, the structure to um, give this vast topic some sort of, sort of narrative, we're going to start with two presentations uh, from Jeff and Anna. And Jeff's going to look at um, what's happening, particularly in art house cinemas in New Zealand at the moment, with a lot of statistical information. And Anna is going to be looking at what is called trans media. And that are all the new platforms and how they are all interconnected and ways in which filmmakers should be looking at using these to take their films to a market. So in some ways, even though these are right at the start, they're like two bookends to, the, to what we're doing today. One looking at... Um, uh, Cinema, di cinema distribution, which has been around for 100 years and really hasn't changed that much. People still pay money and go and sit in the dark and, and watch a film. Then moving through to what is coming up in the future. And then again, to sort of keep some sort of narrative going, um, we're going to start with James, who from the Film Commission, whose job it is to get films out there and find a dis distributor. Then we're going to move to Andrew from Event Cinemas, talking about it from a cinema um, uh, a cinema perspective, then to Michael from Madman, who I have called, not under any way a derogatory sense, more of a traditional distributor, then to Lisa, who's looking at distribution through purely digital channels, and then we'll finish with Annie, who of course is a filmmaker and has done distribution herself using the, these various channels. So hopefully that will kind of give us that, you know, um, quite a, a broad coverage. Now, I'm keen to leave um, quite a bit of time at the end for questions because I know that we aren't going to cover this vast, everything about this vast subject in this session. And if you've got, I'm, I'm very keen to, to get any questions, specific questions addressed at the panel members uh, or general comments from you um, at the end. So we'll try and keep a good 10, 15 minutes for questions. Now, before Jeff starts, um, I just want to ask a question of you. Um, hands up everybody who saw a film festival film at the Civic Theatre during the film festival that's just passed. Okay. Oh, that's very good. Um, so, was it digital projection or 35 mil? <laughs> Call out? Digital. 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 We knew Anyone? We were 35 mil? <laughs> I, I was very stunned by this um, statistic myself. I called Bill Gosden and to ask him that question. And only three of the films that screened in the Civic this year were 35 mil prints, which, uh, you know, is really quite remarkable. I saw quite a few films there and I had no idea whether they were digital or 35 mil. And what it does is it just shows you how the digital um, projection in cinemas has just rapidly taken over because if, if film festivals are which like the last bastion of 35 mil and the art of, of, of cinema are sw have swapped almost completely to digital, then, you know, this is the new age. Okay, that aside, Jeff, over to you. Good. Morena, um, Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoa. I'm, um, and thank you very much, Big Screen, to give me the opportunity to talk about um, my research. And what I'm really doing is paying attention to an increasingly important sector of the New Zealand film audience, the art house sector. Um, but firstly, uh, just some general information about the New Zealand cinema audience. These are just the stats that the 
um, museum statistics gathers. Um, it's sort of the uh, average attendance is sort of confirmed by um, my engagement with my students who have just completed a media diary, uh, 300 <coughs> diary, where they had to compare their media use over a week with someone very different from them, some very older, and going to the cinema was very much <coughs> a minority activity for them. Um, as against my activity, where I have a, I know it's very anal, but I have a bottom line of 52 cinema visits a year. So I can say I go to cinema <coughs> once a week. It's always above 52, but that, that's my bottom line. But what I'm um, really looking at is not so much the, the younger audience as the, y the older audience. Now, dear old um, Val Morgan, um, long dead, but the name li lives on, um, points to the fact that, and it sort of confirms what I've been observing, that um, Val Morgan, who's the leading cinema advertising agency in Australia and New Zealand, is pointing out that the strongest, the grow, strongest growing sector in the film-going audience in New Zealand is amongst older groups. And I think that's why we should be paying some attention to it. Um, as for the younger age group, I, I do argue that they um, are least inclined to do some things and most inclined to do other things. Um, and of course when my students tell me that they prefer to watch films on DVD or downloads, I always ask them, legally or illegally? And when they offer me uh, flash drives with the you know, last 12 episodes of, of something off American television, I politely decline, because I don't want, they, I don't want to actually encourage their practice, and in some ways I want to discourage their practice. So, um, the Hata Ata Cinema. This is um, what uh, Val Morgan says again, and I think some of the panelists this morning will probably talk more, also talk more about the so what points to the expanding repertoire of New Zealand cinema in terms of what is accessible. But I also want to just um, point to an opinion, a couple of opinions, a couple of um, supporting statements, one might say, from other sources, this is from the UK, from The Guardian, that the fact that the UK, the, the Guardian is talking about the old audience being the salvation of cinema going in the UK as well. And um, a piece of variety speak that you also, that, that Hollywood is beginning to take notice, that there is a thriving and potentially very profitable audience amongst older film goers. So I'm arguing that in New Zealand, the art house sector is thriving. It's not in decline. I had a journalist call, uh, ring me the other day and say, uh, art house cinema is in decline. So no, it's actually quite the opposite. The art house sector in New Zealand is thriving. Here's one. Rubies in Wanaka, opened October 2011. Very luxurious. This is the bar where you go in, if we go into the two screen cinema, which has got um, uh, uh, a range of mainstream and art house titles, but it's one of two cinemas in Wanaka. The other one is Cinema Paradiso, which is just located to a bigger premises, and Dorothy Brown's in near to nearby Arrowtown. So, this is one of the cinemas that I visit um, for the purpose of my website, which I won't go and um, access now, but I invite you to go and have a look at it. This is a website I've developed over the last year or so, because there didn't seem to be a website celebrating the art house sector. There's flicks.co, but they're about what screening. My website's more about the cinemas themselves, the, the kind of cinemas, their, their audience, their history, what is interesting in particular about it, what, what catchment area they serve, what are they trying to do in terms of something special for their audience. So it's got full information on art house independent cinemas, the history, I say, their audience, their facilities, what screening facilities they have, what, what, what's the access, um, handicap access like, all those kind of things. There's photos, and I do a personal review of each cinema. I go in quite openly and say I'm going to write a review about the cinema. Wherever possible, I um, actually go to a film at these cinemas um, as per what finances and time I have available. To date, I've visited 65 cinemas around New Zealand. And that, what I describe as art house but independent, I anticipate by the time I'm done there'll be over a hundred around New Zealand. This, the film, the site itself also has um, discussions about film going, 
links to information about film going in New Zealand and elsewhere. Um, there's also, because it's a blog, there's also um, quite a dis healthy discussion by filmmakers and cinema managers who come in and also give their perspective. Uh, now I've got some handouts of the, the front page and the cinema directory if you're interested, if you want a kind of quick look at it. What I'm looking at too is also um, updating information all the time, but adding new cinemas. And it's interesting that I'm adding cin new cinemas quite regularly. In addition to the ones that um, I've noted here, um, there's Lighthouse in Cuba, Upper Cuba Street, and Wigan Street um, under development. There's new two boutique screens in the Embassy in Wellington. In Dargaville, there's a community group um, um, fundraising to actually build a cinema in their old town hall. A, a town that hasn't had a cinema for 30 years. Um, Christchurch is a tragedy area. I've been to Christchurch, but there are signs of things returning. Um, Alice and Video Land, which is probably the best video rental store in the country, is developing a little theatrette as part of their facility. So I'm encouraged all the time. So what is what about what is this um, art, art house cinema? Um, it is, obviously, catering largely for an older audience, retired senior citizens, also the film festival crowd, which is probably more demographically diverse. It tends to be female-dominated, educated, affluent. Um, it tends to middle-brow taste rather than high-brow taste, though it's kind of um, best marigold hotel rather than Jean-Louis Godard. But, uh, and as one um, manager of Waikanae Cinema said to me, anything with Heron Miriman they'll come to. But at the same time, they're seeing films like Le Havre, Separation, Maori Boy Genius. So there is, you know, it's not all um, middle brow. There's also, um, they have, there's particular programs also, um, uh, programs for art house cinema, things like National Theatre on Screen and Opera Seasons. What else do I know about them? Um, they have considerable leisure time. They intensely dis dislike the multiplex environment. They hate the noise, the smell, the teenagers. They go for popcorn-free environments, and that's kind of theme that keeps recurring, popcorn-free environments. It's more a panini environment they're seeking. <laughs> and, it's, and they see film going, it's very much still a social ritual. It's not just going out any old film, it's going out as a special kind of treat or um, ritual to go through. And um, it's interesting that the multiplex is now starting to wake up to the fact that there is this audience, so there's now you know, little boutique cinemas being inserted into multiplexes around the country, places like Palmerston North. I um, get a lot of my information from um, long-time managers, people who've been in, um, involved in the industry a long, long time, like Mike Christensen, and Mark tells me you know, that um, the art house sector now contributes 30% to the New Zealand box office. And I take, it, take, you know, I take it as a, as a source of authority. So there are opportunities. Uh, DCP or digital cinema um, packages and other people will talk about this have certainly reduced overheads and made um, distribution and much more easier um, just in terms of weight and freight but also in terms of labour. But distributors are still beholden, uh, the cinemas are still beholden to distributors in terms of things like availability, timing of releases, and box office returns and ratios. But on the other hand, there are new cinemas emerging which really um, have revived, revived, uh, revived cinema going as a special ritual. And the Roxy and Miramar, which had, I think, $5 million poured into it, by people associated with Weta. It's a place you'd go dress up to go to. It's a really special place. It's dining and cinema, and it's a very much a hoodie-free zone too. You won't see a hoodie in the Roxy. Um, also, I think art house cinemas around the country are now part of the tourist experience, and it's interesting that Tourism New Zealand is actually linked to my site now because they see that as happening. That you go to Wanaka for the snow and the lake, but at the evening you go to one of the local art house cinemas. Uh, Jeff, Jeff yep. we need to yep, just money, but last money. slide coming up. Um, so there are potentially more outlets for local cinema. Um, 
But I think there's still some <coughs> problems and constraints. There's um, power structures involved still with distribution. There's certainly personalities um, and various opinions on distribution, and I counter those in the people I talk to. Some of the small sinners are really, who still depend on 35 millimeter, are really facing a dilemma in terms of expensive upgrades to digital, to DCP, places like Geraldine. How do we get the audience, young audience back to the cinema? How do we stop them downloading? That's a question that we have to address and perhaps address here today. But I guess there's another question is, um, the art house cinema uh, generation is thriving, but is the last generation, will there be another generation coming behind it to replace it? So, I end there. Thank you. Okay, if you see me looking at my phone, it's not because I'm multitasking and texting or anything, it's um, just that I've got my notes on here, probably could have used an old fashioned piece of paper, but anyway. Um, okay, so um, I am doing research on documentary production in New Zealand, and uh, I'm also involved in transmedia. Um, I'm the co-director of an organisation called Transmedia NZ, or Transmedia New Zealand. And um, I have to make a confession, transmedia is actually a word that I, I kind of detest. <laughs> um, because it gives people this idea somehow um, that we're in this sort of new world where everyone has to go out and make apps and make games and, um, and, and abandon all the old ways of, of storytelling and, and it, I think, creates some degree of anxiety um, sometimes. Um, what transmedia really is, is uh, it's about storytelling, it's about story worlds, and it's about engagement. So reaching audiences in all of the places that they are and in all of the ways that they use media. So I think that probably one of the best um, ways of describing transmedia that I've heard is, is the way that Ted Hope described it yesterday when he talked about Pokemon and the way that his son um, engages with that world of Pokemon where the story exists across different platforms and as, a, as an audience member, the, his son can move quite fluidly between those platforms. So I'm not really going to talk about transmedia per se today so much as some of how some of the concepts, the ideas from transmedia can be applied to the world of, of film. So I think that <coughs> we're probably, uh, we probably all know um, here and we've heard it a lot ac across um, the symposium so far that the biggest changes in the digital age are really not with production, um, they're with distribution. Now, production technologies are amazing. I can go out and I can make a film on a phone like this, and then I can go home and I can edit it on my laptop, and that's pretty cool. But what is really amazing is the fact that then I can upload that, that film, and I can get that film to a global audience. Wow, that's incredible. But actually, it's not that simple. Because when everybody has access to all of these technologies and everyone's going out there making films, <coughs> then there's a whole lot of films that are, be that are being circulated out there in the world and being shared. And how then do I get my film to that audience when there's so much competition? And when I have made a film not on my mobile phone but on expensive production equipment with a crew and huge budgets, then I really need to get my film to an audience because I need people to pay for that film, ideally the audience. So, things are really getting complex. And Twitter has just interfered with my notes. Um, <laughs> so, in, in the old days, you know, um, here, here's the big shift. You know, when I, when I make a film on, on my fancy phone, essentially, it's just a film. It, you know, stories themselves haven't changed. Filmmaking isn't that different today than what it was 100 years ago. But the difference is, 100 years ago, you made a film to distribute it. You had to then just take that film and you would show it to people. And that kind of carried on for a while. 
And then television came along, that introduced a little bit more complexity. And then video, and you know, educational markets, and then you had windows and territories, and you know, things became a little bit more complex. But now, we're in this world where there's a huge degree of complexity. We don't just have DVD to worry about, there's a whole lot of other acronyms. There is VOD, EST, that's ele electronic sell through, DTO, download to own, DTR, download to rent, and there are rights that have to be negotiated, not just across different territories, but also across different platforms. And so, with all of that complexity, then you can forget about this idea, idea of DIY, DIY distribution. I think that that is a myth. I think you also have to forget about TID. I'm not sure if that's a thing or if I just invented it, but, um, sorry, TDI, that's my new acronym. They do it. So when you take your film and you give it to someone else and they do it all for you. I think you have to forget about that as well. But there's one acronym that I think is really important, and this is a transmedia concept, I think. Um, D-I-W-O, or D-W-O, doing it with others. Okay, so if there's one message that I want to focus on today, it's that idea of doing it with others. So to, to navigate the complex territory of digital distribution in the new age, you need to have a team. You need experts, you need expert advice. And in a perfect world, you might have what John Rees uh, calls a producer of marketing and distribution, a PMD. Um, but for, for most of us here in that room, that is probably going to be you for the time being. So you need to take advantage of resources that are out there and look at, the, look at information. There's a lot of information available, starting with people like Ted Hope. And um, there are a lot of tools out there that you can use to help you engage with audiences and navigate this complex territory. So I'm not going to talk about them too much, but I'm going to put a list of links up on the Transmedia NZ blog. So you can, and I'll put my talk up there and you can have a look at some of those later if you're interested. But there, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about the experts too much, but I'm going to talk about some other others that are really important in that equation of doing it with others, and that is the audience. They are the most important others. So we've come a really long way from that linear model of production, distribution, and consumption. Now we're in an age where that relationship between the filmmaker and the audience is much more immediate and it's much more intimate, and it is really a relationship. Like it or not, it's really more essential now more than ever for filmmakers to engage directly with the audiences, not just at the delivery point, at the end point, but right at the beginning. Before you even have the film, you need to start building an audience and engaging with them. So the distribution model has really been turned on its head. It used to be that you would make a film and then audiences would pay for it in a way by buying tickets or buying videos and DVDs. Now, with crowdfunding, for example, Audiences aren't just paying to see the film, they might actually be paying to make it. But again, crowdfunding is a funny word. I'd like to sort of take the, the F word out of crowdfunding because it's not just about making money, but it is also a distribution and promotional strategy. So crowdfunding is a strategy that gets audiences to invest more than money. Um, so when I give money to um, a project on a crowdfunding platform like Indiegogo or Posible or PledgeMe in New Zealand, which I have done, what I'm doing is I'm starting a relationship with the filmmaker. So I give them some money because I'm <coughs> interested in the project and I'm passionate about film. And then they start giving me updates about how the project is going. And I will probably start following them on Facebook or Twitter. And they have my details, so I go onto their mailing list. And we start something. And then when the film is ready, and it, it goes to a festival or it goes to a cinema, even though I might have, for example, paid for my, uh, an advanced copy of the DVD, I'm probably still going to pay to see it in the cinema because I'm really interested in this project. And I'm going to tell my friends. And they are going to take my word about this project more than any ad that they might see on a billboard or in a magazine or on television, if they even watch television. So crowdfunding is 
not something that everyone needs to do, but it's just one example of a strategy for engagement with an audience. And that idea of thinking of the audiences as investors and in turn investing in the audience, giving them some extra value, involving them, making a partnership, thinking of them as collaborators. And I think that in New Zealand, we are starting to move towards understanding this idea of engagement. I noticed at the film festival that a lot of people had websites to promote their film in some way. They have some kind of presence so that they are, they are there. But we need to go a lot further in terms of really developing that relationship with the audience and maximizing opportunities. So I noticed at Q&As, often filmmakers would speak and the audience would be really keen to know more about the film and know more, like, how, how can I get involved? Where can I buy the DVD? What can I do? You know, people are, are literally saying this to filmmakers. And I noticed that filmmakers tended not to take advantage of that. They didn't say, well, the DVD is not ready yet, but I've got a mailing list, or I'm taking pre-orders, or, um, or even just reminding people that they are out there, or having a piece of paper and taking names. Um, so Sorry, I think that, that's something. Sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but we just okay. need to keep doing so, so up. that's something that we need to work on, basically. That's great. I'm I, I'm absolutely loath to interrupt uh, because it was such a very interesting, you were really getting, getting wound up and getting going, but we've got some great uh, panellists here and we'll have to keep it moving so everybody gets to get to hear from everybody. Um, before we get on to uh, James, I just want to say that I sp spent years doing what James does now and that is trying to sell films at film markets like Cannes. And right at the very beginning of, of my career in doing that, I fell out of love with 35mm prints virtually on day one. In fact, the first can I went to was in 1984, and Larry Parr said, oh, you have to take uh, this film with you, which was Bruce Morrison's Constance, which was a very long <coughs> film, and it was on six reels. <laughs> and I arrived in Paris. I'd never been, you know, I'd never been to Europe before, and uh, I stood at the top of the uh, escalator at Charles de Gaulle Airport. There were no baggage trolleys anywhere with a suit bag here and another big bag there and the print of the film and I stepped on the top of, a, of an escalator. And I thought, what do I do? You know, do I let the film go or do I go? And I had this vision of ending my life there with this film um, at an escalator at uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport. Luckily, I got my balance and I was able to go down. Right from that point, I thought, 35 millimeter, you know, this is a real problem. At film markets, you get one chance to screen your film to a distributor, and because there's so many other films screening at the same time. And 35mm always had problems. I've been in screenings where the last reel wasn't there. Uh, I've been to a screening of a New Zealand film where one reel came on, upside down and back to front. And when that happens, the distributors just all leave. You know, and you've never got a chance of getting them back in and, 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 and screening the film to them again. I remember once at Mifed in Milan, uh, we were screening Came a Hot Friday, and I, I had, was there at the start, and I, and I had to go back at the end, and I knew exactly how many minutes the film ran. And I got to the end, and I got, got two minutes to go, great, film's finished. And I thought, what's going on? And I asked around, and they were screening the films fast, sort of had the speed sped up, which explained to me why Kiwi accents sound so terrible sometimes <laughs> in these film markets. Anyway, enough from me, over to James. Um, thanks, Paul. I, look, the irony is, um, for me already, I've had experiences where I wish we were back on the 35mm. <laughs> um, this is like this whole session is so so broad, and I'll try and get through as much as I can quickly, so you know everyone can have a say. Um, but yet yeah, today, I really want to talk kind of um, about that that very narrow process of taking the film out to market, and whether, as Paul says, that's a, taking it to a, a, an international film festival or film market, or whether you're taking it out in a local market to theatres. Um, you know, the, the, the things are still the same. So I want to talk about the practicality of doing it, but I also quickly want to touch on this whole transition period and actually what that means for you guys in terms of creating films and do you deliver on 35mm or do you deliver digitally or do you do both and, and how do you manage that whole process? So, um, yeah, look, as we all know, traditionally the way of exporting a film in theatres has been um, by a 35mm film print. Um, and I've brought a couple of things along with me today, but to, to get to that 
mill film print, there's that step process in film always has been where you expose a negative and from that negative you create a, an interpositive. From that interpositive you create a duke negative or int negative and then you would create positive film prints. And um, you know, I'm sure most of you will have seen something along you know, these lines that when those prints get struck they get done in reels. Um, anything from, you know, as Paul talks about the five, six reels or maybe if we're talking about something like an angel at my table for us, it's like a nine reel film. So um, every film, you know, one single print of a film to run through a 35 mil projector could be so high with, you know, nine cans. Um, a wide release in New Zealand not so long ago would be 60 plus prints, 80 plus prints for a film. So already we're sort of taking, let's say six, multiply it by 80, we're talking sort of 350 plus of these reels for every film that gets released. Um, and, you know, just off the back of it, you see the, the waste that's involved with that, um, the freight charges. Some of these prints might get screened for a few sessions in a week and get pulled, and that is kind of the end of them. And at the end of this process, of course, unless we move on those used prints to somewhere else, we are talking about basically destroying, you know, all this material. So what we um, are talking about in terms of digital cinema is a move to, and I brought some of the stuff along because we talk about it in terms of concepts, but you never really see it, so it's pretty hard to get your head around, is a move to, to this. So if you can envisage a room with 400 of these cans, as opposed to a hard drive. Um, we use the term digital cinema a lot. There's actually a lot of variances within that. Um, some of you may be familiar with the term D-cinema and also E-cinema. Um, D cinema, as Jeff has already mentioned, um, there is uh, uh, an acronym DCP, which is a digital cinema package. Some people call this a DCP, it's not, it's a hard drive, but within the hard drive we've got DCP files in here. Um, a DCP file is basically a file which can play on a DCI compliant projection system, and that's a digital cinema initiative um, projection system which plays at either 2K or 4K resolution. And that's a system which all the major studios have basically en endorsed and set up. So when we're talking about D-Cinema, we're, we're basically talking about, um, you know, taking a DCP and a hard drive, ingesting it into a server and digitally projecting it. Um, E-Cinema, just very quickly, is anything that's kind of that tier below D-Cinema. We're talking about MPEG encoded files, we're talking about Blu-ray, high definition Blu-ray, or even standard definition format DVD, which I've been in cinemas and seen played with the play button coming up on the screen right before I'm about to watch the movie. Um, so just to cover off, when we're talking about digital cinema, there's all sorts of variations, but what we're talking about in terms of the really, the big transition is that shift um, really to, um, to D-Cinema or using DCPs um, in, in theatres. And that's brought a, a whole kind of wave of complexities as well as advantages. Um, Clearly some of the pros of moving to this process is we are talking about moving one of these around and not, you know, a room full of, of film reels. Um, we're talking about less waste, we're talking about um, greater security. Um, you can actually create a DCP and put it on a hard drive and ship it around unlocked, which means that any theatre can take it, can put it onto their server to play whenever they want to for however long as they want to. But obviously, and particularly for the studios, but of benefit to us all is this ability to actually um, encrypt those files and make it so that um, a, a theatre can actually only play your film off a DCP if it actually has what we call a key. Um, and in the industry terms, we also call these KDNs. But basically, this is another form of file which can be emailed, can be supplied on USB to every individual cinema which says the time and the date by which they can access the DCP package to project, and after that period, that's it. They can't actually <coughs> access that file again. So there's, there's great benefit, um, I think, in terms of security. Um, there's other kind of ancillary things. When we took the Orator, which Mike was involved with, to, to Venice, we had to provide Italian subtitles. Um, we also had to have um, master materials, obviously, which had English subtitles for our local market. You can have both on one of these and you can interchange between them. Um, and I think with a DCP you can have up to about nine different languages on them and whoever's got it can switch in between you know, the ones they <coughs> want. So if you're going to Cannes or Venice or Berlin, it means that you can create one of these, send it over there, it comes back and then you can use it for the local release as well. Um, as opposed to print where you would have to engrave subtitles into the print um, and then you know, if you didn't pick up an Italian distributor in Venice, 
you've just then gone and taken probably a four or five thousand dollar cost and thrown it down the toilet um, and you can reuse these. Um, why I say that it's really interesting, you know, Paul's comments about th this kind of shift um, and, and why sometimes I like the idea of going back to 35 mil is you can get incredibly bloody nervous going to a film market like Paul says, you get one shot to play it and you have no idea what's in this box. Um, the file could be corrupted, they might have put the wrong files on there. Um, this can get lost. Um, the last market we went to in Cannes, we turned up at the consignment office to check and you know, there's film cans there, but then there was these just <coughs> millions of little cardboard boxes that people had sent in with their drives. <coughs> and poor Remy behind the desk could not find our box with our driver and it took 24 hours for us to get confirmation. And you know, you see this poor Frenchman behind me comes pulling out stuffing of all these boxes and you're just sweating knowing that this is your one chance. So um, there's that. The keys themselves are a whole kind of another ball game. Um, in order to generate those keys, the cinema you're using has to send you the details of their server so you can get your lab facility to create the key and send back to them. Um, if those details are even slightly wrong, the film won't play. And we've already had films where kind of at last minute you're trying to negotiate with the festival and your lab, and often if we're on the other side of the world there's that big time difference, and, and trying to get the right key to them. Um, so, you know, they're both, they're, uh, you know, there's no doubt that going this way is a tremendous advantage. Um, there is a, a massive uh, capital implication, um, and that has implications uh, particularly for exhibition across the range. You know, for Andy at Event, of course, you know, who are kind of leading the rollout here of digital, you know, that, that's fun, they've got the capital and the infrastructure to do that. You've got little independent cinemas which are having to find that, you know, I'm guessing it's about 150, 200,000 bucks per projector to put this in. And if you're kind of, you know, if you're in Martinbrook, which is kind of a little cinema which isn't far from where I am, that's a big outlay for the people that you get in through the door. Um, just uh, quickly before I finish up, I think, um, you know, the other issue I wanted to talk about was managing this transition and how the, the capital outlay of putting these projectors in has kind of created havoc, I think, both locally and internationally in terms of people progressing at different times. So I know in New Zealand, I think we're up to about 160 of our 410 screens being um, DCI compliant um, projection systems. Um, Norway is fully compliant. Um, Hong Kong is pretty much there. If not uh, probably 95%. Yeah. Norway being fully compliant means that unless you can deliver your film as DCP, your film won't get screened in Norway. So that, that's pretty sobering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the US, that are, you know, you kind of expect to be up there, they're 70%. Um, the UK will be totally there by the first quarter of 2013. And why I mention this is because, um, you know, particularly for you guys as filmmakers, you're looking to kind of deliver your film to your sales agent or to your distributor. And you kind of get to this headache of like, my God, do I have to create an interpositive, an internegative, or, or, do, or even a DI, or do I just do it on DCP? And you know, there's quite big cost implications, particularly as a lot of you, the budgets these days are having to come down. Anything you can try and save um, is important. The answer really there at the moment in this period is kind of, there is no answer. You need to talk to your distributor and your sales agent and say, okay, is this a genuine theatrical proposition for this film, or is it actually going to be home entertainment? Um, it may be theatrical in New Zealand, but actually outside it may just be, you know, VOD or something digital that you have to deliver. That's a dialogue you have to have with the sales agent, it's a dialogue you have to have with your distributor about what they need. Um, the, the last thing I want to say to finish off is, you know, we talk about this, this transition, um, and I think Briar raised a really interesting question last night with, with Ted Hope about, you know, I really like the old way, can I just stick to the old way? And, and I think Ted's response was really, you know, adapt or die. It's, you may like that, but the, the world is changing. Um, to me, we're in a period, well, we've hit an age where I think it's always gonna be changing. Um, you know, it, this isn't the transition. This is a transitionary period, which I think is just going to continue to evolve and change, and we are just gonna have to adapt or die. And I, I just wanna sign off by, um, I guess, saying that even with Norway, we talked about them being, you know, fully, um, you know, de-cinema capable. I just read in the trades a week ago that they are now ditching these and they are starting to deliver all their films via the internet. Mm. So everything I've just said about this little box actually goes out the window when we're moving to something else already. Thanks, okay. James. Um, <laughs> um, we're now going to zipping along. Um, look at it from a cinema point of view. And I was just thinking about this <coughs> and Jeff, probably correct me, because he would know all about the such things as this. 
is that it occurred to me that every major change, and the cinemas, as James just, has just outlined, are going through a tremendous um, expense to converting to uh, DCP compliant um, projection. So every change that's happened in technology on f in the 100 year history of, of cinema has been to get audiences, to increase audiences, make it more attractive for audiences to come to the cinemas. You have you know, sound, colour, uh, cinemascope, Dolby Stereo, uh, IMAX, and just leaving aside um, th the 3D uh, projection at the moment, which requires um, DCP, this transition, this tremendous expense, is not being done to attract audiences um, to cinemas at all. In fact, some people might argue that the, the, what they're seeing is, mm -hmm. is not as good as 35 mil. So it's just an interesting um, point, I think, to muse on and a segue into Andrew from Event Cinemas. Right. So um, I represent the evil empire. We're all the business side. Um, we only care about money. <laughs> so that's, that's the brutal truth. That in the end of the day, we um, represent uh, employment. We represent um, the livelihoods of a hell of a lot of people. Probably a lot of you here have worked at a cinema at some time. If you haven't, I really actually recommend that you consider going in and even just um, doing a day's work to see what it's like. Um, the, the, the reason why we're an evil empire is that we all actually, everybody involved in our business is very poorly paid. From the top to the bottom, <laughs> we're not what you expect. We all are in it because we love it. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of, of our mindset, that we actually learn everything about filmmaking. The majority of the staff there, you'll find, are extremely passionate. They, they know everything going on with your side of things. They know everything going on with the business. And what they learn is that we learn people's motivations for coming out and seeing films and for what's actually going to bring them in. So our whole business is problem solving as well. So we're all about making sure that people are still coming in to see our cinemas. So the question that, that, that Paul said there, re raised there really is why, is why are cinemas internationally moving towards digital distribution? And a large part of it can be answered with automation. The, um, with, there is a sense of a decline in overall international numbers of people attending cinemas. Um, in terms of filmmakers, that, re rep that represents there is a decline in the amount of money that will come through to your film. There is a decline in the number of sessions that you will get for your film. Um, that what cinema, cinema exhibitors are forced to do, whether you're in an art house or you're in a mainstream, is focus on those films that are actually bringing in people. So we're the best of intentions from a bunch of people who love film, who love cinema, who want to supply a really broad range of movies. And I guarantee you that New Zealand has the world's broadest selection of movies on offer at any one time between our art houses and our main and multiplex. You would be amazed at the comparative. It's absolutely the widest variety of films you will ever see in any one country. Um, that we have that need to reduce costs at, at all levels to allow us to even show your film, right? And the reality is a lot of Kiwi films are, are losses in our, in, in our real world. So we've gone digital because it means that we've, we've been able to supply a high quality offer at the lowest cost possible by reducing the number of projectionists that will ultimately be involved but also increasing the standards of the quality offer that we actually play. So digital from day one to day 900 is going to be like that premier print. You know, you're going to walk in at any time and you're going to see it at the same quality. But also we know that we're going to receive a drive and it's going to play on every single one of our screens. Whereas we might find that we receive one film print, we can only play it on one screen and then it's going to disintegrate in their hands. You know which has happened. Um, I guess so, so that's sort of an overview. But the, the, for the country, the rollout is extremely expensive. And it's being supplemented by what's been called a virtual print fee scheme. Um, so different countries in the world have each negotiated a different way with the studios um, that the territories represent as to how and why we exhibitors should pay for this equipment that really mo mostly actually benefits distributors. So 
distributors um, used to pay for film print. They used to have to pay for you know, uh, making it in the way that James has said, but, it, but each individual print could cost a few grand, you know, New Zealand dollars. So to supply 80 prints it's a brand new film, you know, that's really expensive. So what you get now is a hard drive that, depending on who you are, might cost you a few hundred dollars. And that hard drive, theoretically, could one hard drive could service every cinema if you had the organisational ability to do it. Um, so really the benefits are all in the distributor level. So this virtual print fee scheme has been negotiated whereby distributors actually pay us for every film on every screen. So there is a supplementing fee that's going to operate for the next 10 years that's just recently been instigated in New Zealand. And that means that every film, every session, anything digital, whether it's a private hire or a public performance, will have a fee associated with it. Now, um, where that comes in for you guys is if you're going into self-distribution, um, the, the standard sort of um, filmmaker hope at the moment is that digital distribution means um, free distribution. And unfortunately, that's not the case. There are a wide range of costs that you will encounter, whether it's paying for the KDM if you choose to go down that way, the mastering of the DCP. You cannot get onto a New Zealand screen without a DCP if it's going fully digital, if it's D-Cinema and DCI compliant. And the reason for that is automation, that if you come to us with a Blu-ray or a QuickTime, theoretically we could plug it into the beautiful new projectors that we have. However, it requires us to hire someone to press play every time and to do a whole bunch of automation. Sure. Yeah. And we can't guarantee that the product that you supply us is of the standard that we need to for the customer who we must maintain that standard. How much is the virtual print fee, you know, roughly? I mean, what are we talking about here? Um, it, it's, it's difficult for oh, me I to... I don't know yet, I haven't negotiated. Uh, no, 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 well, there's a fair, fair amount of secrecy surrounding right. the whole yeah. thing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the next question is, yep. will New Zealand films, can they negotiate an exemption? No, nobody can be exempt. <laughs> nobody can be exempt. This also includes <laughs> film festivals. And we're literally discovering day by day at the moment what this, this limits us in doing. Um, it's been negotiated at extremely high levels and by people who frankly probably don't program film and never have and don't understand what we do here. So for, for someone on our end of the business, it's actually really frustrating dealing with this fee scheme because we want to actually support filmmakers locally. <coughs> we care, we genuinely care. So we bust our balls to try to make an opportunity for everybody to get their film on screen. Um, this fee scheme, though, isn't damning. It's not the end of the world. It's really just, the f it's, what it's doing is it's defining, if you think that your film is cinema ready, you have to back it with a little bit of money. But you always did. So back in 35 millimeter, this is so much cheaper than 35 mil, right? You won't have anywhere near the cost that you have with 35 mil. So you're already saving money. So, so are we talking month. about like uh, $50 a screening or $100 or it, it, a it's a screening? Scheme, or? It's a scheme that works. Um, there are different contracts for every studio. There is a different contract for people who aren't related to a studio. Um, the general thing is that, that you negotiate a fee that will cover you for two weeks. Um, it guarantees you a certain number of sessions. If the exhibitor doesn't supply you with that session number, so we're talking like, let's say, two, two daytime screenings, two evening screenings um, for two weeks, and then that fee will ensure that you get that number of sessions. If they don't come through with the sessions, if they miss one session, you don't pay that fee, okay? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the main thing for you is if you're thinking um, self-distribution, you really have to consider the marketing costs that you're going to put in and the fact that this, that this um, DC, uh, that you have to pay a fee, right? And almost every one of the, the dis exhibitors in the next couple of years will be having that scheme because we've all been told that film will not be supplied potentially by this time next year. This time next year, all the major exhibitors will be fully digital. Most of the independents, that's including. So you'll see inside of a few years, 95% of your screens will probably be D-Cinema. Well, can okay. I just quickly, really quickly, the cost of a key is about 45 bucks. Um, and the last market that we went to, they required us to provide 70 keys. Um, so there is actually a cost even around the, the keys to the DCPs. I don't think Andrew 
um, is from an evil empire at all. <laughs> had very good relationships with event cinemas. But there is an interesting thing before we get to Michael. There has been a kind of a, a subtle or not so subtle shift in the in the sort of uh, paradigm here because before digital, once the cinema had a 35 mil print, it could play it and play it and play it, and until you went round there and actually collected it from and took it away, um, you didn't have any control. With the KDM. You know, particularly the major studios, you're issuing a, uh, a, a license to screen that film at 8 o'clock tonight, and that's it. After that, you can't screen it. So if you owe us money, Mr. Cinema, Mr. Evil Empire, if you don't pay us the money you owe us, then we're not going to issue the KDM, and therefore you can't screen the film. So there is, there is kind of a, has been a shift in the, in the dynamic there. Yeah, isn't it? and to be, uh, just to comment on that, that actually, um, really will protect you with the independence a little bit more. Um, you'll get issued with reports. It's all very clear. It's easily accountable. And um, a, a, a multiplex, it's easy for us to pay you. It's not difficult. We've got all the systems. With um, independence, that was <laughs> really where you're going to start seeing that little bit of sneaky, did we, didn't we? Right. Moving on to Michael um, from Madman. Michael has, <laughs> is the sort of distributor you want to handle your film. Um, he was responsible for Boy and its phenomenal result here and uh, many other films including Out of the Blue. Michael, I'm, I'm, I knew this would happen, you know, we're kind of time is, is rapidly contracting so we're going to have to, you know, no worries, move cool. fast and leave time for questions. Um, the digital, uh, you know, shift in, in, in my space has been really, really rapid. Um, I reckon 18 months ago I'd never had a DCP print in my hands, now that's pretty much all that we have. Um, it has changed the, the, the cost basis of us as distributors. We're not paying the freight, we're not um, paying storage, we're not paying the film bolt handling fees for the prints and whatnot. Um, all of that is, is, is a big upside. It's also uh, changed uh, how we go about advertising our movies and the spend into online versus traditional print advertising. That's into a shift, our media buyers are now telling me I should be mobile phone advertising and stuff. So that's all, um, you know, it, it, it's all in a process of unfolding. Hey, I have a love and hate affair with it. Sometimes I still want the 35 millimeter film because it's not corrupted. You know that it's there. Um, it, it, there's, there's not the, the, the technical hiccups that uh, we sometimes get with digital, um, but we're slowly mining those out, I think, you know, as, as more of the DCPs come through and everyone gets a bit more of an understanding with, um, with, with, with how they work. I guess the best thing um, for, with, the, uh, with the digital distribution is the ability for us as distributors to expand a film very, very quickly. And um, the Orator was an excellent case in point because we put it into Andy's theatre down in Manukau and the Samoan audience went absolutely bananas for it and, I mean, there was not a spare seat. And in the space of a day, those guys had like got it playing in multiple theatres in that complex and we'd got it into other complexes very, very, very quickly without having to strike all the prints and all the rest of it. You know, it was, it was literally an overnight thing. So we could respond to the, uh, to the audience. The VPF um, arrangement is very new. Um, the agreement, I think, came into effect August 1. Yep. Um, with the major circuits, so uh, Madman, who is a member of the Australian Independent Distributors Association, AIDA. AIDA has signed an agreement that covers event, Hoyts, cinemas here, and Reading are in it too, I think? Um, not yet. Okay. There's another agree a separate agreement under negotiation at the moment with the collective independent cinemas in New Zealand. And, um, hey, as these guys just said, it uh, means that we distributors pay a fee to play in that digital screen. Um, there's a different schedule of fees for if a film comes in uh, subsequent to the first week of release, okay? There's a different schedule of fees for alternate content, operas, ballets, theatres, all that sort of stuff. The document is, like, seriously sick. I've not read to the end of it yet. And, and, and it, hey, it's, it's, it's really new for all of us and we're working out how, how it's going to pan out. I mean, I think personally that 10 years at the levels of fees that we're talking about, we're more than paying for all the projectors. But, hey, there are upgrades 
you know, I mean, um, Peter Jackson's 48 frame rate, that needs a bolt-on, you know, upgrade into your projector. Um, three, you know, they're, they're, they're forever um, updating the security and whatnot. It, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's here to stay. Um, the digital space, I mean, you know, it hasn't, um, it, it, it hasn't changed our audiences, you know, it's changed what, uh, what we can offer audiences with the 3D and the 48 frame rate, but, you know, we still ask the same question of films when, when we first see films or we read scripts, you know, it's, we still ask does that film know its audience and, you know, we define, um, you know, the picture and still largely, um, you know, still go about it the same way. I guess a, a, a big shift is in, our, is in our marketing ability through the social media. I mean, that's becoming very powerful. Uh, I don't think Mad Men have it absolutely nailed how we engage with, 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 with people who are into our brand. Um, but, you know, it's, it's um, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're learning as we go along, as I guess we all are, um, you know, in this space. I'll hand it over Thanks. to the next. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I'm really sorry we're having to speed things up here. But um, before I get to Lisa, I just want to say that my experience of dealing with the film business, particularly the higher up on it you get, you find that it's, a, it's actually a very conservative business. People really don't, uh, are not keen to embrace change, strange that may seem. And I think the real reason for that is that people are very scared of their jobs. You know, no one in an in a, in a American studio is actually going to put their neck out and say, let's, hey, let's do this, it's completely new, we'll be the first to do it, because if it doesn't work, mm. you know, they're out, they're out the door. So if you're somebody who's trying to convince people to uh, embrace something new, you know, you really are a, uh, a pioneer in everything that, that goes with that. That's my introduction to Lisa, who mm -hmm. you can tell from her voice, she's American, but she's a resident, how long have you been resident here now? Oh, I've been there for years. Yeah, and has very yeah. long and distinguished career in the States and um, is involved in exploring new distribution channels, right? Yeah, I want to talk about um, North America and uh, digital distribution in a little bit of a different way. Um, primarily, the kind of um, paying a fee in order to uh, stream or download content in North America from uh, a video on demand service like a cable satellite um, service such as DirecTV or electronic sell through, which is an internet servicing like uh, Amazon Instant Video or iTunes. No use of physical media, DVDs, that kind of thing. Um, viewed on your television, on um, personal computer, on a tablet, or even on a smartphone. Um, could be subscription-based, could be transactional, which is just you know buying a, a one-time uh, download or streaming of the content. So in talking about the new way forward, which is um, our theme in the symposium, the future of, of media distribution is digital and the future is now. This is going on uh, very currently in uh, North America, and uh, it's a growth industry. It's very dynamic and rapidly changing. Americans now spend an average of $166 a month on digital downloads, uh, according to Variety Magazine in May. Four in 10 U.S. adults are paying to download entertainment. One in five Americans have a connected television where they can you know, basically push a button to uh, download your film. 21% uh, of Americans download movie and television content. And with a population of 314 million, that's 66 million people that are uh, downloading video content. Uh, and we're not even talking about Canada. Um, one in four tablet users are accessing video content. Um, I've, I've read that in, by 2014, 240 million smartphone users worldwide will be accessing video content. Uh, so in terms of the North American um, digital sales industry, this year has been very profitable. 
electronic sell through is up 22%, and video on demand is up 11.6%. Uh, beginning in 2011, really, home entertainment in the U.S. is back. Um, and it's on the um, heels of these <coughs> kinds of services. In contrast, physical media uh, is declining. DVDs, Blu-ray sales um, are down 33% from last year. The rental business is in decline, uh, everything except for kiosk, which is kind of a, an area that seems to still be doing well with DVDs. Warner Brothers has shut down their direct-to-video um, division, in fact, um, putting all of their eggs in uh, this kind of digital distribution. So it's really something to consider as a, a new way forward. Uh, and what I wanted to do was to just give you my um, personal top 10 tips for New Zealand filmmakers interested in North American distribution. And here's number one. Do believe that your film can be sold in North America. Uh, I find that there is an overemphasis on domestic distribution uh, in New Zealand, and that filmmakers are told and that many accept that their films are destined to be only shown in uh, New Zealand. But uh, e even Parliament, you know, is talking about supporting the arts and film um, for New Zealanders. But uh, there are New Zealand films, despite New Zealand content, that are appealing to a worldwide audience. Um, Ted Hope was talking about niche audiences uh, in the United States. It's really a US kind of concept because you've got to have a lot of people to divide up into different audiences. But um, do believe that there are people that will be interested in your content. Number two, don't believe you or your film is any less Kiwi if you want to get digital distribution or if you are uh, internationally distributed. Um, I think the, the New Zealand content funding imperative, the privileging of uh, national cinema here or the word used at the symposium a lot has been local cinema, um, can be a disservice to filmmakers if it makes filmmakers believe that they are not, their films are not accessible or of interest to a worldwide audience. Digital distribution makes it more open than ever before. Number three, don't confuse film festival screenings with distribution. Uh, more than once I've heard a producer say that they're not interested in talking about distribution because they're planning on entering film festivals. Um, you go to film festivals to find a distributor. It's not a substitution for um, finding a distributor. Um, I, I understand that people want to take an overseas trip and see how it plays in a screening um, with festivals, but do remember film festivals cost money, distribution makes money. Number four, don't not explore distribution because you want to go to film festivals. Not all international film festivals will mind if you already have a distribution deal, especially if your film is not in release in that territory. Don't wait until after attending the film festivals to talk to distributors. They may be willing to hold back um, releases until you do the film festival that you want to do. Uh, your film is only new once and the clock is ticking. Um, despite the fact that yesterday we heard, uh, oh, well, people will be seeing your film, you know, 10 years from now, so don't worry. I would say you need to act fairly rapidly when you have a new product. That's what people are looking for. That's what buyers want. Number five, don't upload your whole film to view on the internet for free. <laughs> You know, you don't want to be in that position if you're going to try to get some revenue um, out of the film. Certainly give that a shot uh, before uh, doing that. You know, I'm not talking that there are free on-demand kind of services. People are definitely doing <coughs> that in the U.S. and have that, um, have content available to them that way. But um, it's, it's not, um, 
necessary and it doesn't mean that you can't get um, revenue for selling the film into distribution digitally. Number six is secure all copyrights, music rights, get errors and omissions insurance um, as soon as you can. You just want to have all of your documentation together so that when you go to a distributor you can roll with it. Um, you need to make sure that those are all secure. Number seven, don't sign a distribution deal for all territories, all media for a long period of time. Do be savvy about the lengths of your distribution contracts, uh, which territories are involved, which media are involved. Um, Costa Botes, the New Zealand filmmaker, has put on his website under uh, lessons learned uh, this very advice to uh, spread your risk and opportunities between different territories um, and different, different media. Um, eight, you're up too. <laughs> yeah, I got that. <laughs> I it, also, <laughs> digital distribution um, do, does not include, I just want you to be clear, it doesn't include theatrical or broadcast, so you can maintain those rights and sell those separately. Number eight, thank you. Um, don't feel that you are required to sign with the New Zealand Film Commission that for distribution because you are not, and I think um, James can confirm that. Um, even if they put money into your film, you do not, you have a choice, you don't necessarily need to sign with them. Can, can I, shall I quickly speak to that? Mm. Yeah, because, mm. yeah, just to clarify. Yeah, very, very quickly because yeah. we're running out of time for rating and we're I mean, running out of time for At least it's absolutely right. Just to clarify for everyone in the room, there is, there is no standover um, in terms of who you want to, to represent. Yeah, obviously we do represent some New Zealand films. You can absolutely come to us with another agent. Um, you, you, part of it, we just have to make sure that if there's a high level of investment from the commission right. that we're happy with that. Right. But okay, sorry, you're going to have to um, fire these last two out. And, and, uh, Number nine. Don't automatically assume a distributor is looking to rip you off. Um, you obviously are going to want to know how much money are you going to make. Uh, the short answer is it depends on how many people buy your film. Um, in the case of digital distribution, download or stream it. Vendors such as DirecTV, Amazon, Instant Video, iTunes will take a fee. They deserve a fee. They're providing a service. Uh, could be. Um, you know, even around uh, 70%. But um, the distributor will also ask for a possibly um, 20 to 40% on average, you will find. But that still leaves you, for your part of what you're entitled to, 60 to 80%. And we're talking about a lot of people and a lot of downloads. Finally, number 10, run all contracts by an attorney. The best money you can spend. Okay, great. <laughs> You should see about, they're fantastic points. I mean, I agree with all of those, um, apart from here is the thought that a distributor might rip you off. I mean, how would you possibly think of that? Um, but we should try and get them on the website or whatever that people couldn't have that. Any, I'm, I'm not even going to introduce you, go straight into it. Okay. I'm actually going to call on my um, DIY, W-O, do it with others. <laughs> Anna, Anna's going to um, bring up a website that I have built. Kia ora tato. good to see you all, lots of um, familiar faces. Um, just reflecting on today's panel and also the um, events I managed to go to yesterday, it seems two of the lessons repeated at this event is first how to be cognizant of distribution while you're in production as filmmakers, so be thinking about distribution, which I think is tedious, you know, in some ways there's so many demands while you're in production, to think about distribution while you're actually trying to make the film is like another level of exhaustion in a sense, and I think a lot of filmmakers relate to that. But the other one, the other way is, um, so, and to do this, I think, if this is today's reality, one way is to build a digital presence um, that's appropriate to your particular film, and I think we need to think appropriate here, and the other way, I think, is to think about flexibility, how to provide a film that could, range, could satisfy a range of markets. Now, I'm talking, obviously, of something that pertains to documentary, where broadcast and educational outreach is a good possibility and a greater possibility. But theatrical is often used as a bit of a loss leader to draw attention to a film. And Anna also talked about um, 
what now sometimes is referred to as the attention economy. That's become the problem in the world today. There is so much stuff out there. How do you draw attention? So a theatrical for a, a documentary, and particularly quite a difficult documentary like Brother Number One, is really about bringing attention to, to the title so there will be name recognition, for example, when it shows up on American TV and is one of 800 channels. Um, now, I was going to race through, I mean, the topic today, I think, is distribution and digital. Is that right? I barely read, actually, what it was. But to address <laughs> those two things, um, first of all, just to give you a bit of a kind of overview, keeping that thing of a kind of digital platform and, um, and flexibility in mind, which are kind of my two key words. Um, Brother Number One was funded as something of a hybrid. You might know it was funded by both the Film Commission New Zealand on Air through TV3 and did get a bit of money from the university too. Thank you to you all. Um, so already it was kind of a hybrid and already I had to be thinking of both a television and a theatrical market. So already I have a 99 minute version and a 44 minute version. Radically different films, but films that have to be kind of repurposed for those markets. Because I have had dealings with the international marketplace, I knew they needed a 50 something probably for broadcast internationally. So I also cut a 56 minute version. We were asked to a French film festival, so we did a French <coughs> subtitled version. And I also did a Khmer version because of the Cambodian community and for those Khmer people that do not speak English. So already I had a kind of range of things. So, um, so I think that that's what you need to think about. You do need to think about your distribution in terms of providing something that is flexible that is addressing this ever-changing marketplace that we find ourselves in. Um, the film had pretty good exposure at film festivals, including some A-lists, and I did what I was told. I went to IDFA in Amsterdam with a long list of sales agents I wanted to meet. I tried to, to kind of make contact them with them beforehand. I met with about 30. About five were interested, and I did decide to go with a distributor called um, Cargo Film and Releasing in New York. And I went with him because he's enthusiastic. Lots of distributors say, oh, you know, Annie, it's a really hard subject, and you know, things are really hard at the moment. <laughs> and you've just kind of killed yourself making this thing. You don't want a depressed distributor or sales agent, it's the last thing you need. So David at Cargo was enthusiastic. He seemed to understand the new marketplace. He, I felt, was going to do those hard yards that I really didn't want to be doing, which was researching into new technologies, new modes of distribution, striking deals, heaps of research, I think, that needs, um, needs to happen. And I've been pretty happy with him so far. So if flexibility was the one arm, the other thing I mentioned was digital. And I think this is what's a struggle for filmmakers at the moment, and actually has been a kind of theme that's arisen at this event. But we did, and thanks to Anna and to Kate Stevenson, who's currently in um, LA, we did do a project called BMO Digital, Brother Number One Digital, and we started it early. And maybe it didn't get quite the attention it should have had because, because the film itself, I was producing, directing, and writing, and doing a lot of the editing. So already it was a big project. But we did a pretty good fist of it, I think. So we have a fairly sophisticated website. I might get you to drive it for me, if you mm -hmm. wouldn't mind. Um, which has things like filmmakers' blogs. We were sort of tw twittering. We now sell DVDs through the site. But the thing I want to focus on primarily is the study guides. I'm going to click on the English one. Um, I, I, I wrote some extensive study guides which are free online with additional clips from the film. Um, I managed to read the NCEA guidelines, which nearly killed me. That was one of the more difficult things I had to do. Um, so we've made two extensive study guides, one for English and media studies and one for history and social studies. And they are aimed at sort of secondary school and early university years. And um, what we do, as you can see, there's a series of questions. And I might, we could just do, like, for example, we'll go up a little bit. Um, brother number one establishes a series of contrasts between beauty and cruelty, trauma and innocence, past and presence. <coughs> Identify key image shots or sequences which suggest such contrasts and explain how camera work and editing contribute to the meaning of the image. And then the idea is that they, you could click on um, that one. The idea is that they watch the clip and answer those questions. 
Of course, I get all these teachers ringing me and saying, can you write an answer book? <laughs> and then I thought, oh, my God, we've just done all of that. So then I turn around and I've written a like 40-page answer book. So basically, you could go online and see this. And it's been fun in a way, you know, because it does draw together two of the aspects of my life as a filmmaker and a teacher. Um, it got pretty, I mean, but it wasn't just altruism. I've also been as commercial as I can possibly get. We, we, um, we were a little late, but we got this out before our theatrical release in New Zealand, and teachers that were onto it brought their students along in the daytime sessions, which pleased the cinemas. So we would get school parties of up to 20. Um, we have also produced a premiere DVD where you get the answer book. My idea is to write the um, online guides which are available to everyone, but cunningly, I have um, written the questions so people can't answer them unless they've seen the whole film. So they can pretend to, but to get the kind of whole film and the answer book is the kind of premier DVD cost. So, you know, it is a bit of a work in progress. How it will float internationally, we're still figuring out. But, you know, generally the distributor and sales agents are pretty pleased to have these additional resources. I felt it was something I could do and I felt it was appropriate to the film. So. Um, so that's what I mean. I mean, there's all of that, God, I've got to stay up till one in the morning, Facebooking and Twittering, and, you know, and I'm so exhausted from editing. There is that kind of pressure, but I think we have to think quite specifically about the films we have, the kinds of outreach that would suit them, an online presence that's appropriate, and I guess that's what we have tried to do in my T-I-W-O-T, who <laughs> I will now have to resuscitate. But thank you. Thanks, Annie. Um, we have run out of time, but I see Jackie. Is that you up there, Jackie? Is, can we have do some questions, or do we have to get out there? You, you can probably get one or two. Uh, okay. Start, right. Okay. So, uh, if you can get a microphone, and um, I insist on the microphone <coughs> so everybody can hear. And, and if you can address it to an individual panel, I mean, if that's appropriate, that'd be really good. Uh, you don't have yeah, to, so but that would help. Sorry, but I. Hi, I'm Chris Ferber from EIT Hawke's Bay. Uh, I just want to know, uh, with the DCP uh, uh, hitting the cinemas, is there still a chance for people to show their individual films when they can't afford to have it encoded in those systems? Um, it's yes, yes and no. Like, uh, there's a, it's going to depend on your local cinema. Um, we at event, I can speak for event primarily, we can, um, we're looking to provide a, a, keep a 35 millimeter offer in every location that we can. Um, the reality is, is that you actually have very limited amount of space in most projection booths. So to try to put in a full size D cinema offer beside a 35, Let me clarify, it's difficult. Input, other, other digital input? Other digital input, um, yes. If you're looking to do that, um, I, there are costs. There are probably still some costs. Yes, um, so most independents will still maintain an e-cinema offer. Um, e-cinema is perfect for that kind of content. D-cinema, theoretically, you can plug in a Blu-ray player, you can plug in um, a computer, you know, you can still put it through, and when you put it through those projectors, it looks amazing, um, but it, you, you can't avoid the so, cost. So something to negotiate with the individual yep. cinema and that. Thank you. Next question, anyone? No, it's someone up the back there first, and then we'll come to you. Yeah, eCinema, you still have to... Hi, um, I don't really know who to address this to, but once you've distributed your film, like got the DCB, how do you archive it? Like, how do you ensure that you're going to be able to see it in like 20 years' time? Yeah, It's actually a very good question, and, and that the whole issue of archiving um, digital material, I mean, with 35 millimeter print, you know, it's 50, 60, 70 years old, you can still stick it in a projector and watch it. Who knows what's going to happen? Who feels yeah. qualified? Oh, yeah, she, I, I can actually speak this. There's some really interesting research going on at the moment um, where uh, if you have, a, if you have a, a digital hard drive that's in storage for more than 10 years, there's a very good likelihood that it will de um, degrade. So most major archives, digital archives internationally, actually have to keep servicing those you know, just putting them through, using them to a degree, and so you've got these massive computer-operated, robotic-armed libraries yeah. happening. A, th a 35 millimeter, thousand-year life in storage. Yeah. Anyone doing oh. that in New Zealand at the moment? Did that archive? Is the film archive doing that? Anyone know? Quick, yes or no answer? Uh, 
no one knows. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, that's an issue. No, and it is an issue the industry is going to have to address. How New Zealand films are being uh, mic coming down to you? Oh, sorry. And just one more. Okay. It's um, this gentleman here actually had his hand up first. Yeah, right over here. Um, this is more of a general distribution question, but something I've been thinking a lot about the last six months, there's been some really good local films come out that no one has gone to see at the movies. And then you've had all these signature dramas on TV One which have done amazingly. But, you know, as a filmmaker, I don't want them. TV movies, I don't want to make TV movies, but I'd rather make a TV movie if I could guarantee half a million people watching it on a Sunday night. So how do we bridge that gap as you know, filmmakers making you know, art? Mm. Okay. Very good question. Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess the, um, th th there's a lot of noise out there in the entertainment space. And y you've, you've, got, you've got to uh, make a, a, a picture and work with a team that somehow manages to rise above that. Um, I, uh, I feel very comfortable, what Jeff was talking about, the art house and the older audiences. That is where I feel most comfortable. Um, Any time a picture comes along that is in the kind of 16 to 30 age bracket, I get nervous as hell. Because you're competing against video gaming, they're pirates, that audience, they haven't got a lot of money, do you know what I mean? You could have TV campaigns to get at that a Absolutely, yeah. So um, uh, all my buddies think that it's boring as hell that most of the movies I do are like French, you know, comedies and we do a fair amount of documentary stuff now. Um, so, you know, I gravitate towards that, that sort of audience. And, and Annie, yeah. Annie was saying, um, you know, it's difficult to think about distribution when you're making a film, but you should certainly be thinking about who you want to go and see it um, and strike it, you know, strike it, strike it accordingly. But there's a strange irony at the moment, which the budgets for those telly movies are much more than the budgets that are being proposed for cinema. And I would love to see more initiative. And, you know, cause every so often we hear rumblings about funders getting together and collaborating in a kind of more four, channel four kind of way. But I think that that really makes sense. And that's what I meant in terms of flexibility, that what you know, I guess I've tried to do is think of those different outlets when I was actually in production. I mean, I automatically had to have a, a, a theatrical. And we did okay in cinemas, actually. Um, but um, I, you know, I already had to be thinking of those two audiences. And I think that that's definitely the way of the future. Okay, right. That's it, I'm afraid. Look, thank you for the panel. Can I just say one thing quickly? I've got cards here for brother number one. If you want to join yep. my website, you get special <laughs> bits and pieces on the site. <laughs> thanks to the panel. Uh, thanks very much to Phil Moore for the sponsor. And thank you to Mr. Paul Jeffrey on the who's done a fantastic job.